Good morning, dear colleagues, dear friends. Uh, it is now nine past nine, and this will be the latest start of our lectures during the course, I suppose. Uh, let me tell you from the very beginning that you're very lucky people. You're very lucky people because you're here, because you're studying international law, which is a, which is a fascinating thing, and because you're going to participate in the Jessup competition. I'm now 38 years of age, and 20 years ago, when I was a student, I did not have an opportunity to participate in any moot court competitions. They simply were not there in the country where I did my bachelor's degree. I studied international law at the University of World Economy and Diplomacy in Tashkent, in Uzbekistan. Then I did my master's at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. Then I did my doctorate in international criminal law at the Humboldt University of Berlin. And it just happened so that I could not participate in any moot court competitions as a participant, as a student. After my master's degree, when I started my work at the International Committee of the Red Cross, I had a chance to organize several moot court competitions on international humanitarian law, but that's different. Being behind the scenes of an event, organizing it, is not exactly the same as being a participant. So you are very lucky to be at Jessup, in Jessup, as participants as young as you are. Second, I am sure that all of you are very motivated because spending a week uh, of your holidays for studies is quite a challenge. So thank you very much for being here. Before we start, let me share with you two requests. First, let us be punctual. So today we were late by nine minutes because we had to solve technical issues. Uh, from tomorrow onwards, I hope we shall be able to start sharp at nine o'clock and to finish at 10.45 sharp. My second request is please be active. Please ask questions. Please share your comments with, with your friends and with me. Please doubt things that I will be telling you. Please question them. Because the more you question, the better you will study. Why is this important? Because we actually have an impossible task in front of us. Impossible because it is impossible to study international law within a week over five lectures only. So, the task is impossible. But we shall do our best. Uh, together with the organizing committee, we have identified five topics which, in our common opinion, should be most useful to you, and we'll focus on them. However, however, we will, uh, you will have to do a lot of extra work during this summer school and after it, in the course of your preparation for the Jessup competition. I will now show you something, it will be a little presentation, then I will show you some materials that I have prepared for you and which I hope will be useful for you. And then, today, and we shall be using the board until the, rest, uh, until the end of the class, because I would like you to think with me, to follow the topic of this introductory class together with me. I would like you to focus on a fascinating thing which international law is. And from tomorrow onwards, uh, we'll, be, we'll be using more PowerPoints. But today, I would like to, to get you involved. Let me switch off the light for a couple of minutes because I would like to show you something.
Do you know this picture? No. Can you, can you try to think what this could be? Any ideas? This is a picture, but a picture of what? Ah, that's a good idea. And very often people suppose this is the black square by, by Kazimir Malevich. It's a good guess, but no, it's not. It's not a square. It's a rectangular. So, any more ideas? What could this be? Yes, please. Thank you. This is an excellent guess as well, but it's not. This is... This picture is called the pale blue dot. And it's, it was taken on the 14th of February 1990, when none of you were born, I suppose. This picture was taken from Voyager 1, at a distance of 6 billion kilometers from Earth. And in fact, it is the picture of the planet Earth. You see, there's a little dot here, the pale blue dot. That's why the picture is called the pale blue dot. I'm showing you this picture because I would like to share with you the story of my favorite international lawyer. That's him. And surprisingly, my favorite international lawyer was not a lawyer at all. He was an astronomer. His name was Carl Sagan. He was the author of, of this project, Voyager 1. The, pro, uh, the project was related to astronomy. But in relation with the project, he wrote a book that, in my view, reflects the very essence of international law. And I would like to share with you some excerpts from this book in order to lead you into the philosophy of international law. Just think of it. Someone who was not a lawyer at all expressed the very essence of international law better than many international lawyers could ever do, in my view. Look what he wrote in the introduction to the book. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joint suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, Every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mount of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic area. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. And finally, the Earth is the only world known, so far, to harbor life. 
There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we have ever known. Isn't it great? It's all about international law, although it seems to be about astronomy, but no, it is about international law. Why is it so? Because all international law is about peace and war. If anyone ever asks you, what is international law about? Be sure to say that international law is about peace and about war. It's about relations between states and peoples who have been striving towards peace throughout their history, but who have been, been fighting all the time. International law is a very powerful tool that you, as lawyers, already have in your hands and will be having and using for the rest of your lives. So be sure to constantly study international law, to follow its developments, to be sure to think where its deficiencies are, where its weaknesses are, and be sure to think how it could be improved. Because international law is very often the last hope of a people, of a state. <clears throat> In many international lawyers' opinion, among other things, uh, international law has been, over the past three years, Ukraine's main hope. And it will be. So, the future of your country is in your hands because you are international lawyers. And be sure to use this very powerful tool for the sake of your country. Now, let me show you something else before we proceed to the substance of this class. Uh, I told you at the beginning of the class that our task is virtually impossible. So to make it more possible, to make it more feasible, I have prepared something for you. And I'll show you what. <clears throat> I have prepared a folder with useful materials for you. I will give the folder to the organizers, and it is my hope that they will make copies for all of you. The folder is my course of public international law that I teach at Kimap University in Almaty, where I work, to bachelor students of, uh, of international law. So, this, uh, this, the course this week, is a concise version of that course. So it's basically selected, uh, selected lectures from what I teach back home. However, I would like you to have a full set of my materials. The folder that you will have copies of contains two subfolders. So first, there are presentations. Uh, the presentations cover the general part of the public international law course. Then there are some presentations on the law of peace, and that's why I said that all international law is about peace and about war. So there are some presentations about uh, the general part, that is who the subjects of international law are, what the sources of international law are. Then there are some presentations on international human rights law, on uh, diplomatic law on international trade law. These are selected topics of the law of peace. And towards the end of the course, 
there are some, uh, some presentations on the law of armed conflict, that is, on the use of force on international humanitarian law and on international criminal law. But much more importantly than that, there is a second folder, which is called resources. In this folder, you have a subfolder called the UN International Law Handbook. This handbook was recently produced by the Codification Division of the United Nations, and it is a four-volume set. See, there are books one, two, three, and four, with some of the main instruments on international law. Let me just show you the table of contents. The, the book covers virtually all topics of public international law, starting from the law of treaties, subjects of international law, diplomatic and consular relations, peace and security, uh, human rights, etc. So, then there is a table of contents for book two, three, and four. So, have it, study it. It contains pretty much all the materials that you need to have at hand as international lawyers. Likewise, there is a subfolder called General. In this subfolder, you have some of the best textbooks on international law, electronically. You have Akehurst's Modern Introduction to International Law, you have Malcolm Shaw's textbook on international law, and many others. Everything in electronic format. Have them and use them. Plus, there are some subfolders corresponding to each of the topics of the course. Origins of public international law, nature sources of, uh, of public international law, states as subjects of international law, international organizations, etc. Just let's open up any of them randomly, and you will have some of the best articles on the given topic from the European Journal of International Law and the American Journal of International Law. I hope that these resources will be, qu will be quite useful for, for you. So, very soon you will have all those materials and enjoy. It's a lot of reading, but international lawyers should not be afraid of reading. Do you like reading? Yes. Very well. For now, I will end the PowerPoint presentation and I will suspend my talking because I would like to let you talk. From now on, let us try to have a discussion about international law. Let us recall some of the main features of, of this law. Let us set a tone for the rest of the course. It seems to be very easy. <clears throat> Public international law. But what is it about? Let us devote the rest of the time to discussing these three simple words. And we will see that, as a matter of fact, they, they are very complex. There are many things behind this simple phrase, public international law. What is law? Ladies and gentlemen of the law, what is law? Thank you so much. There is, there's a second microphone. Let's, let's use both of them. So I'll be using mine and you'll be using yours. So it's a set of rule, rules and norms. In any sphere. 
Mm. Oh, let us let's stay with the keyword law for the moment. So, it's these are rules and norms to regulate relations in any spheres. Very well. What is the difference between rules and norms? Marina referred to both rules and norms. Is there any difference between these two? Or do they essentially mean the same? And is there, by, is there anything to add to this list, by the way? Yes, please. How interesting. So the rule seems to be the content of a norm. Yeah. Very well. And there was an interesting idea here about principles. I suppose I'd like to add that it is how we can have more rules of international law, of public international and private international law. Excellent. So the keyword principles is here. Plus, there was a mention also of private, and we'll, we'll come back to this keyword. Um, what are principles, and why are they important to us alongside with rules and norms? Yes, please. Good. So principles are rules of international law in this, in this case that serve as a foundation for all other rules. Uh, said arguably there are ten of them, but well, let's make them seven plus three, right? Uh, we're used to thinking that there are ten principles of international law because that's what's written in, in international law textbooks, in some of them. In fact, if you pay closer attention to that, and let me challenge you, these principles are not necessarily principles of international law. And let's argue about that if you want. Seven of them are principles of the United Nations. Yeah? They're contained in Article 2 of the Charter of the United Nations. And that article does not say that these are principles of international law. They're principles of, the, of a universal international organization. Probably this also makes them principles of international law, but I don't know. In a strict sense of the word, they're principles of the United Nations. Three other principles were added to that list by the drafters of the Helsinki Final Act in 1975, right? That final act contains a declaration of principles, but arguably those are principles of the OSCE as well. Or are they, are they really principles of international law? I don't know. There are at least two points of view about this, and both of them could be right. Let me Add one more item to this list. Law is also about purposes. It's about rules that set some models for the future. These rules tell us what we would like to see our future to be. You will recall that the Charter of the United Nations also contains Article 1, that is called Purposes. <coughs> Article 1 of the UN Charter lists the purposes of the United Nations. Can you remember any of those, by the way? Yes, please. Excellent. Marina? Very well. So you see, the very 
first purpose of the United Nations that came to your mind is about peace and security, which again reiterates what we said a couple of minutes ago. All international law is about peace and war. Well, now it's more about peace, because after 1945, international law changed fundamentally, and it ceased to be predominantly the law of war. It is now predominantly the law of peace. Very well. Who makes law? Who creates law? Entities. Entities like what? Um, <coughs> like law is created by people who live in um, states. So states as entities and international organizations. Like, uh, yeah. Excellent. Law is created by people who live in states and if they, if they want to, establish international organizations. <coughs> of course, there are many theories about the emergence of law, about how law is created. Some say law is a social contract along with the state. Others say that law is given by God, especially in countries where Muslim law applies, where Islamic law applies. So there, law is considered to be rules given to people by God. And by the way, there is such a thing as Islamic international law. You may want to read more about that. It's very, very interesting. Uh, by the way, one of the problems of current international law, in my opinion, is that current international law does not sufficiently uh, profit from the experience of Islamic international law. And if you think of it, dozens of states in this world are states where Islamic law applies. So they, those states and those peoples are members of the human family and they have a rich legacy to learn from. So you will find among the resources in those folders some, some materials, among other things, on Islamic international law. And you may want to, to read more about that. So, international law is made by people, said Marina. There is a very interesting theory about the creation of law that is called the psychological theory of law. Did you hear about that? Yes, you seem to be nodding. What is the psychological theory of law about? Um, as, the, uh, as the understanding of law uh, as the, uh, the instrument for uh, the resolvement of the conflicts um, in the world, in the international community, probably, um, as far as I remember. Thank you. Does anyone have a more specific explanation of the psychological theory of law? Yes, we have at least two more ideas. I think that every entity is a social uh, structure and the law is the thing that was created for um, enabling this social structure to exist. I think that uh -huh. that's right. Thank you. And we have one more supposition. based on individual instincts, how one sees things from different points of view. Is this right or is it wrong? So that makes it wrong. Thank you, that's it. The psychological theory of law is about our human feelings and emotions. It's about our feeling that killing is not okay. Stealing is not right. Beating up someone is not good. War is a bad thing. So, from the point of view of that theory, all law is about human psychology. It's about what we, as humans, living in this given society, consider as right and wrong. 
And we all know that societies are different and values are different. In this part of the world, it is acceptable to have one wife. In some other countries, it is acceptable to have up to four wives. And the attitudes, the respective attitudes to this and that are different in the given societies, which is, a, which is acceptable because peoples are different and their values are different. So, law is about values, essentially. It's about what a given society considers as valuable and abhorrent, about right and wrong, about good and evil. So, in that sense, indeed, law is about values shaped as rules. And international law corresponds fully to this, to this concept. 2,000 years ago, it was absolutely fine to conquer other countries, to enslave peoples, to, it was okay to have slaves. Now it is not acceptable anymore because values have changed. Even 100 years ago, war was an acceptable means to settle disputes between states. Now, after the establishment of the United Nations, it is not an acceptable means to settle disputes anymore. Why so? Because values have changed. So, all law is about values, about what people consider to be acceptable in their given society and what they cherish. Let us now move to the middle column in this definition. So, the law that we're going to discuss during this week is international. It seems to be simple, but what does it really mean? And by the way, do you know who authored the term international law? Who was the author of this phrase? Uh, well, there was one specific person who invented this, this very term. And this brings us, on the one hand, to the psychological theory of law, and on the other hand, to the role of the doctrine in international law, to the role of academics, publicists, lawyers, that they play in international law. So, can you try to remember who this could be? Any ideas? Hugo Grotius, uh, that's an excellent idea. He's, he is considered as one of the fathers of international law, but the term is not his. Uh, actually, he used a different term. Jeremy? Yes! I'm very sorry about my handwriting. It's terrible. Uh, that's why I will, I will speak aloud everything that I will, I will write on the board. But, on the other hand, it's an interesting exercise. You will see what we'll have at the end. So, the term international law was invented by Jeremy Bentham indeed. What do we now mean by international law in the 21st century? What do we imply when we use this phrase? Actually, we imply many different and important things. We imply that this law is for and among various peoples. And let us add an S here. And Actually, this is an illustration of how important sometimes one single letter is. You will learn more about that in your exercises with my colleague David Scott. Now, whenever 
you will, you will be working on your legal memoranda, memos, uh, on your research, please pay attention to every word and to every letter, because sometimes a single letter can make a difference and change the very sense of what you want to say. So, international law is for peoples and among peoples. It, is, it applies among states and international organizations very well, and this is reflected even in the very terminology that is used. So, in English, we say international law. Do you speak French? Does anyone speak French here? If not yet, please take my advice. International lawyers must have at least some knowledge of French. Please take some time to acquire at least a basic knowledge of this language. In French, the term that means international law is droit de Jean. And this word Jean means peoples. So, for the French, international law is a set of rules, it's law that applies among the peoples. Does anyone speak German here? Yes. Marina, what is international law in German? Interesting. In German, actually, there are two phrases that, that denote international law. One is, the first is internationales Recht, that Marina mentioned. And this phrase is pretty similar to the English phrase international law. Although this word Recht does not quite, does not mean exactly the same in German, as the law means in English. In German, the word Recht means both the subjective right and the objective right, like Pravo in Ukrainian. However, in English, you, you, we differentiate between the right and the law, right? Yet in German, there is another phrase that means almost the same. It's Völkerrecht. So, and whereas in this phrase, the word Nation, nation, is emphasized, in the second phrase, the word Volk, or Völker, people or the peoples, matters. So, in, in the German legal terminology, both nations and peoples mean a matter. You have mentioned Hugo Grotius. What was his term for international law? Do you remember? Actually, I don't remember, but... Uh, I can't remember it. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you seem to have an idea. The law of nations, Prava Nazi. The law of nations was the term that Hugo de Groot, better known as Hugo Grotius, and some others used, such as uh, Emmanuel Pufeldorf, for example. <clears throat> but again, the law of nations is an English translation of the original Latin term that they used, and the original Latin term was Use the law of the law of peoples. Or else there was an alternative term. Use intergentes, the law among nations. Why are we doing this exercise now? This this will help us to understand the, the nature of international law. We used, we used to thinking about law as 
something that is created by the state and imposed upon the people. However, international law is essentially different. The nature of international law is different. I will argue that international law is much more democratic than any other law. You will tell me why. And I will tell you because international law is made by the states for themselves. International law is essentially a law of coordination. States come together to make international law and international law applies among them. So imagine that all of you are states. You are all equal as states. None of you can impose any rule upon another because you are equal as states, naturally. So international law is much more democratic than national law is because international law is not imposed from above. International law is made by equals to be used and to apply among them. But who are those equals? Let us ask the next question. So who makes international law? Is it the peoples, the Gentes, the Jean, the Felka, or is it the nations? And by the way, what is a nation? What does this word mean, a nation? It's a, a people that lives in the, some uh, the, uh, territory and have the identical... Uh... Mm -hmm. So, you seem, to, you seem to relate the word nation to Nazi. Mm -hmm. Let us think of the well-known term, the United Nations and of how it was translated, for example, into Ukrainian or into Russian. The United Nations is translated as Objednane Nazi, right? Objednane Nazi. But who are the nations? Are these really the peoples who live in certain territories, or does it mean anything else? Yes, please. Thank you. That's it. In English and in some other languages, such as German, where the word nation applies, uh, or French, where the word nation applies, nation is almost identical to the state. So essentially, in English, whenever we refer to a nation, we mean a state. That is a people, a collectivity that is resonant on a certain territory has a certain national identity, but the word national is not identical to the word ethnic. So, national identity means that this people is related to a certain state, and together they, they, they form a nation. So, international law is a law that applies among states, in other words, among nations, that create this law, that shape international organizations with a view to reaching certain identifiable goals that cannot be reached by states alone. And this leads us to this column. The word public answers a number of questions relative to the nature of international law. What do we mean by public law? What is public law? Uh, the law between uh, private uh, entities, like 
Very well. Essentially, it is correct. Almost all of the time when we say international law, we mean public international law. However, there is also such, such a thing as private international law. And of course, private international law regulates relations between private individuals and entities, whereas public law most of the time regulates relations between state entities and between the states, between the state and individuals and legal entities on the other hand. Very well. Private law includes very generally civil law, right? It includes labor law and it includes family law. Anything else? Essentially, these are these three branches of law that are universally agreed to constitute private law. If a legal relation in the area of civil, labor or family law includes an international element, <coughs> this moves this legal relation to the, into the domain of private international law. So the rest is about public law. Well, consequently, public international law is about relations between states and international organizations that relate to the, to the official sphere, the public sphere, not the private one. And this brings us to two questions. So, if public international law regulates official relations between states, what is a state? How do you define a state? And now let me move to this part of the classroom to make them hot. So what is a state, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, please. Uh, state, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, not only the territory, it must be uh, agree all another subject. Sub it has their own borders, uh, has their own um, people who live on this territory, and has the official representatives. Uh, Thank you. This is excellent. I mean, I wish I had students like you. No. My students are good, but I would like all of my students to be like you. So now we have heard an almost full definition of a state. So a state is about territory. A state is about permanent population. A state is about a public authority or a government. That is, authorities that govern that territory and that population and that represents this entity in its relations with other states. So, a state has to, have, has to be capable of entering into and maintaining international relations with other states. So these four criteria are essential to any state. Can you think of any other criteria that, in your opinion, are essential to a state? Does a state, for example, has to have its financial system, money, currency? Yes or no? 
Yes, you say yes. Uh, are there any states that don't have currencies of their own? Maybe somewhere um, in Africa. Maybe somewhere um, in Africa. Mm -hmm. Well, don't, do not look that far. In the European, the European Union has a collective currency. So, states that use the euro, well, they don't have a currency of their own. There is a collective currency. So it seems that a state does not have to have a currency of its own to be a state. There are states that use American dollars and don't have a currency of their own. So having a currency is not an essential attribute of a state. Does a state have to have armed forces to be a state? No? Can you think of examples of states that don't have armed forces? Actually, Japan. Japan? Yes. It's a great example of a state which didn't have, don't have any armed forces. Thank you. That's excellent. Japan is the most obvious example of a state that officially has no armed forces, but nobody doubts that Japan is a state. So, having armed forces is not an essential attribute of state. But these four, they are essential and necessary attributes of any state. And how do we know it? Or where do we know it from? We know it from a very useful document that is, hmm, let me write it on the top. The document was adopted in 1933 and is known as the Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States. You will find this document in the collection of documents that I mentioned earlier. This document is easily identifiable on the internet. It's not lengthy, so please take your time in the nearest future to get an idea of what the Montevideo Convention was and is about. So this document lists these attributes of statehood. They are customary. They are as valid now as they were back in 1933. So, whenever asked what is a state, be sure to refer to the Montevideo Convention of 1933 and to list these four attributes of statehood. Let us now discuss some examples. Is the Vatican a state? Yes or no, and why? Let me go to that part of the classroom as well. So, is the Vatican a state? Yes or no, and why? Hmm. Who wants to answer? Yes, please. I suppose the Vatican is a state because it has all the uh, necessary features of it, um, but it is so small and uh, does not participate in relations with every state and uh, does not have some um, values to share, for example, with Islamic states. And, uh, Thank you. Let this be sorry. Let this be a task for everyone to verify whether the Vatican is a member of the United Nations. So please check for yourselves whether it is a member of the United Nations. It is important. Marina? I 
just wanted to say that that can be something certain. So it's stayed like um, the Torian. Mm -hmm. uh, entity? Yes, entity. It's stayed like a entity. It's something certain. And uh, um, if talking uh, in general, it's more a state than it's not. So it's stayed like entity. Thank you. So. It's something else. It's different from a state. It's a state-like entity. Well, if we go into the specifics, it seems to be correct. Does the, does the Vatican have a territory? Yes. yes. But it's, it's so small. Does it, does it, does it matter that, that the territory is so small? The size does not matter. What is important is to have a territory. Well, does it have a, popula a permanent population? Really? That's the problem. That's the problem. Why, why is it a problem? Because uh, there is no permanent population and, there, and that is necessary for, uh, uh, for a state to be a state. Exactly. The Vatican does not have a permanent population. Yes, it has a population of churchmen, of uh, ecclesiastical servicemen who, who are resident in the Vatican during the period of their service, but they do not necessarily reside there permanently. By the way, a permanent, a permanent population ha somehow has to reproduce itself. And it's quite difficult in the Vatican for the population to reproduce itself. You had a point to make? Yes, uh, I mean, the, the, the like the, the Vatican, it is like the head of the Vatican is the Pope, and he has all the executive and uh, legislature, legislative and judiciary power. So we can basically say that they have the authority and they have the government, and they have this capacity to enter into international relations. Because the basic idea of the Vatican is that like one of the functions that they carry is the diplomatic function. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is the entity. Thank you. So the Vatican has is headed by the Pope. Technically, it is an absolute monarchy because the Pope has all the legislative, executive and judicial power. Um, does it matter that the, the Pope is elected, that the head of state is elected and, not in, and, that, and, and does not inherit his power in an absolute monarchy? No. Technically, it does not matter. By the way, a couple of months ago, I had a, uh, I was on a panel of examiners during a retake in the theory of state and law, and there was a student at my university who made a fantastic point about the Vatican. Uh, it was a girl, she said, when the Roman Pope dies, his power is inherited by the Roman son, by the son of the Roman Pope. And when the, when the son dies, the, the power is transferred to the Roman grandson. That was, that was fantastic. Uh, so, yes, technically the Vatican has some attributes of a state, but not all of them. Therefore, we, we are justified in saying that the Vatican is a state-like entity. Very well. But, nonetheless, nobody doubts that the Vatican is a subject of international law. It has the rights and duties under international law. It maintains relations with many states. Please check, check again about its relationship with the United Nations. It's not quite a member of the UN. Uh, what about the permanent population? How do we define a permanent population of a state? Citizenship. Yes. A permanent population are citizens or rather nationals of a state. And here we come back to, uh, to this notion of nation. A state's permanent population is constituted by the nationals of, a, of that state. Why are, the words, why are the words nationals and citizens are not quite the same? We often think that 
Citizens and nationals mean the same, but in legal terms, they're somewhat different. Try to find the difference. Like, um, you can say that you are nationals of Ukraine or that you are citizens of Ukraine, and you will be right. But if I say that John is a citizen of the United Kingdom, I will be somewhat wrong in saying that. Why? And that's a point about terminology. You will find many tricks like those in, in the compromis of your, uh, of your future competition. So please be sure to pay attention to every word, to every term that you will encounter. So, why am I correct in saying that you are nationals or citizens of Ukraine, but that John, that, but saying that John is a citizen of the United Kingdom would not be quite correct? Yes, I am coming. I think uh, the pretty part here is that uh, the United Kingdom is the monarchy and uh, he cannot be the citizen, he is uh, Italy. Hold on, the subject. Yeah. Exactly, that's what I meant. Nationals or nationality is a general term that applies to all states. However, because states are respectively republics and monarchies, Republics have citizens and monarchies have subjects. Piddani. Mm -hmm. So please be sure to pay attention to, lead to the little details like those. How is nationality acquired? How does a person, how would a person become a national of his or her state? By birth, right? By birth, mm -hmm. and the second, I think it's maybe uh, to move to this country in in, in the childhood, maybe, mm -hmm. or in the uh, on an adult, but mm -hmm. live for some time in yeah. this country, m uh, and to know the knowledge, and to maybe um, know the traditions mm -hmm. of this country, and uh, so. Thank you. Exactly. The two main modes of acquiring a state's nationality is by birth or by naturalization. So, naturalization is the process of acquiring a state's nationality as a child or as an adult, but not by birth. Uh, a naturalized national applies for nationality in accordance with a procedure that is, that is set within a given state, uh, and if the procedure is complied with, nationality may be granted. Yet, in order for a person to become the national of a state by birth, there are two main ways. Let us remember them now. So, exactly, there is the so-called right of blood and the uh, and the right of soil. In, yeah, in English we don't say earth, we say soil. Can you please remind us of how this works? If you born uh, in uh, some country, in some territory, it is about soil and you uh, become a citizen mm -hmm. of this country. But if about uh, blood, if you, your parents have citizenship of USA, mm -hmm. you become an uh, American. Thank you. More specifically, if one or both parents are nationals of a state, the child might become the national of that state. Yes, and every state can um, choose whether they have both the, the, the law of soil and like the, the right of soil and the right of birth, mm -hmm. or they have only one of this. I mean, like either they are ch they choose that only if the person is born on our soil, it means mm -hmm. that he is the citizen, or if both. He has some uh, connection connect, connected with the mm -hmm. blood. He still is our citizen, mm -hmm. even if he is born abroad. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's excellent. So it's up to each and every state to 
place an emphasis to emphasize one of these two principles or to combine them in any way. In other words, every state establishes its own rules for granting nationality by naturalization or by birth. Very well. Um, it may be useful for you to also know the Latin terms for these two principles. So the right of blood is sometimes referred to as the jus sanguinis and the yes and jus soli is the is the latin phrase for the right of soil very well the government is the third attribute on the list the government is easy means that a state has to have some organs exercising the legislative executive and judicial power that's, that's easy, but let us keep this element in mind for our class on state responsibility. This will be very important for our purpose in that class. Because every state is represented by its legislative, executive and judicial bodies. And fourth, a state has to be able to enter into and maintain international relations with other states. How does it work? It works through diplomatic channels, that is, states can maintain bilateral diplomatic relations, or else they can maintain multilateral relations at international conferences and at international organizations. Mm -hmm. So, to learn or to refresh your knowledge of diplomatic law, please have recourse to the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations of 1961. That is the main document of contemporary diplomatic law. And if you, if you, make, if you, if you study it, you will know almost everything about diplomatic law. Diplomatic relations are essentially bilateral relations that states maintain with one another. In order, to, in order for states to maintain bilateral relations, there is such a useful mechanism as recognition. I'm sure that you've heard about it. What is recognition in international law? So the recognition of states. government and they have the declar declarative and constitutive uh, declar uh, yes, the recognition of the state. Oh, that's correct. Let's be more specific in one aspect. You've said the international community recognizes the state. Is it up to the international community or to another state to recognize yes. the state? It recognizes the government. Uh, or represents of the country, uh -huh. so of the state, and it is uh, about uh, new uh, new states, uh -huh. about new entities. Thank you. Yes, it is about the state. Uh, uh, so recognition can be individual or collective. Yes, if a new state emerges, it can be recognized by other states individually, or can be done collectively. For instance, if a new state becomes a member of the United Nations. Yeah? The very fact of a state's admission to the United Nations means that the new state is collectively recognized by the existing members of the United Nations. Or else, uh, a new state can be recognized by other states individually. Actually, it happens most of the time. But then the question is, how many, how many recognitions does a state need to become a state? How many recognitions should a new state require to be a state? One, two, ten, a hundred? Or is my question valid at all?
don't make an effort to uh, disclose this agreement mm -hmm. uh, about creating a new state. So they agree silently. They do, mm -hmm. uh, do not do anything. They are passive mm -hmm. in their uh, recognition, mm -hmm. but it means that they, um, they take this state as valid. Thank you. Indeed, recognition can be explicit or implicit. If a new state emerges, other states can send diplomatic notes to the new state to the effect that, yes, we recognize you as a new state and want to establish dipl uh, diplomatic relations with you. Or else, recognition can be, can be silent uh, and be expressed in the mere fact of cooperation with the new state. So, as regards recognition, please be aware of certain terms. Recognition can be carried out de jure, that is, as a matter of law, through a diplomatic note, through diplomatic correspondence, whereby another state or other states recognize the new state explicitly and as a matter of law. The de jure recognition is final, it cannot be withdrawn. It means that other states, they really mean to recognize the new state and they want to establish relations with it. Or else recognition can be de facto, can be as a matter of fact, without a formal diplomatic correspondence, can simply be expressed in cooperation with a new state, however temporary, and recognition de facto can be withdrawn. If circumstances change, so a state that grants a de facto recognition can take it back. Let me approach you again. You have mentioned the constitutive and declaratory theories of recognition. What is that about? Well, basically, the constitutive is one that is de jure. Mm -hmm. That means that another state uh, uh, proclaims or, or states that we recognize the other state, and uh, through cooperation, through adopting different international treaties. And the de facto, it means basically declarative, so it, it, the state exists with the basic fact of its existence, mm -hmm. and uh, it is um, proved by their cooperation with, another, with other states. So, mm -hmm. as, as I understand, this is just simply the same as the Jura and the Fakta. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you agree? Should, should we have a discussion? Uh, yes, we should. Because the, because the doctrines of recognition that we have now mentioned essentially re uh, relate to the recognition of governments. Not, so these doctrines, the constitutive, uh, uh, the constitutive and declaratory recognition relates not to, the, not to the recognition of states, but to the recognition of governments. So a state is there, a state exists, but there is one element, and only one element, only one situation in which this question emerges. That is the situation of an unconstitutional change of government. If within a state, a government, a new government comes to power, Constitutionally, the new government does not have to be recognized by other states so, because it is an internal matter of that state. Elections happen or power is transferred to, uh, so from the former king to the new king and there is the issue of recognizing the new government does not simply arise. However, if the government within a state changes unconstitutionally, as a result of an armed conflict, of a revolution, of another process that is not provided for by the Constitution, other states have to decide for themselves, are we going to recognize the new government? So that's why, that's why or that's where, the uh, 
constitutive or declaratory theories of recognition, that's why they matter. So the constitutive theory means that a new government is becomes only becomes empowered if it is recognized by other states. In other words, a constitutive theory uh, implies that a new government becomes capable of maintaining international relations with other states only if other states recognize it. Whereas the declaratory theory means that a state or a government is there, well, it is a matter of fact, and this fact has to be accepted by others. And because the new government does represent this territory and this population as a matter of fact, it has to be dealt with. And uh, to move on to the concluding part of this class, let us discuss the issue of international organizations. Who, what are international organizations? Is the United Nations an international organization? Yes. yes. Is Greenpeace an international organization? Yes? No. Why not? I just know that this is not. <laughs> you just know that it's not. Is the International Committee of the Red Cross an international organization? No. 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 Yes. Why yes? Well, from my point of view, uh, international organization is, uh, uh, has its own documents that a lot of countries from the world, nations, ratify and sign, mm -hmm. and they are all parties to this organization. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you have said that the ICRC was not an international organization. Yes. Why? Uh, actually, I can Let's ask the friend. Well, uh, maybe because uh, the international organization is uh, um, an entity, uh, members of which are the states. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for example, uh, the UN is an international um, organization, uh, the European Union, uh, but which we can't say about the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Thank you. supranational community, it's like supranational entity, and uh, as for the international organization, yes, it is basically the, the main members of this organization should be states, and they, have, should, they have, should have their own statute that is adopted by the states mm -hmm. that regulates the, the, the functioning of the organization. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, the European Union is not an international organization, and it's correct, it's not. It, it is a supranational organization. Traditionally, that the international organization will have uh, authority which gave by the state, but the international committee is a traditional organization and then uh, is uh, allowed to be international organization. They have the special status or another mm -hmm. international organization. They have different mm -hmm. because they uh, do work which uh, have uh, diplomatic character. For example, the humanitarian diplomacy. When states can uh, have any uh, speak with terrorists, for example, for rebels, uh, it through the International Red Cross Committee. Mm -hmm. They have compassionate and they uh, try to make peace between states and between another subjects or combatants. Or mm -hmm. maybe terrorists, we may call the unlawful combatants. Thank you. 
Um, one important aspect, the International Committee of the Red Cross would never say that a person is a terrorist. No. Uh, that is important. Because the International Committee of the, of the Red Cross is neutral and it seeks to provide, uh, to offer protection to victims of armed conflicts and to assist them, it would never say that, an in, that a person is a terrorist because the person who, who would be called a terrorist would not then grant access to the International Committee of the Red Cross to the victims. Uh, the ICRC would, in, in such a situation, would employ the term persons participating in hostilities. That's very neutral. Without, without saying whether that participation is lawful or unlawful. And by the way, another term that you have mentioned, unlawful combatant, is not a term that is not a term of the ICRC. Uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross would simply say individuals participating in hostilities. So, to come back to the definition of international organizations. An international organization is indeed a union of states. Most of the time, when we employ the term international organization, we mean organizations such as the United Nations or such as the organization, the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, UNESCO, UNICEF, etc. So these are unions of states. In order to differentiate them from organizations such as Greenpeace or Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International, we say that these organizations, Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International or Greenpeace, that they are international NGOs, international non-governmental organizations. But the United Nations or the OSCE or UNESCO and UNICEF are international intergovernmental organizations. So, um, the phrases international organizations and international intergovernmental organizations are synonymous. So, and they're used interchangeably to distinguish themselves from international NGOs. So members of international organizations are states, but as members of, of international NGOs are individuals, right? Second, we have said that the European Union is not an international organization, but is a supranational one. Why? Why is the EU not an international organization in, in, in terms of law? Well, the European Union, it has its own system of law, mm -hmm. European law, and it has the priority over their national law. And the idea of the European Union is that they do not represent the states in their um, in their supranational or, um, organ in their supranational bodies i mean like in the european commission and so on they gather the representatives of the states but they represent the common interest of the eu mm -hmm. and not of every particular state and in the country if we talk about the international organization each representative of the state he represents the interests of his own nation mm -hmm. thank you so the essential difference between international organizations and supranational organizations is that supranational organizations such as the EU uh, ensure the primacy of their institutional law over the national law of the member states, whereas in interna international organizations are based upon the principle of sovereign equality of states. So, in international organizations, the law of the organization does not prevail over the domestic law. It's, uh, there are mechanisms for the implementation of the law of the organization into the uh, domestic legal orders. Whereas in supranational organizations such as the European Union, the law of the organization has primacy over the domestic law. Third, international organizations have, a, have permanent structures any international organization has a set of organs that in which member states are represented and that function on a permanent basis. This makes international organizations different 
from, for example, international conferences. International conferences also gather states, but they're temporary, whereas international organizations are permanent. Is the Security Council of the United Nations an international organization? No. What is it? It is the body, one of the bodies, one of the main bodies of the United Nations. Exactly. The Security Council is a, is a body, it is an organ of the United Nations. It functions on a permanent basis. Its legal status and powers are explained in the Charter of the United Nations. It is an organ of an international organization. Is UNIDROIT an international organization? No. Why not? Because it's also a structured element of the United Nations. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have anything to add about the legal status of UNIDROIT? Please check it for yourselves. Please check for yourselves the legal status of UNIDROIT. What? I can actually do a mistake, but um, UNIDROIT principles is international trade principles, and I'm not sure about the structure of the organization, mm -hmm. but. Um, this is the, the key law principles which are which represent international customs. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure whether it's an organization, but mm -hmm. still it's just the e scope principle from my perspective. Mm -hmm. But I will check like, the structure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So please see about the legal status, the structure of the but, uh, but anyhow, the difference between an international organization and other international organs consists in that international organizations have a permanent structure. They, they function on a permanent basis as prescribed in their statutory documents and they have permanent structures, unlike some other international organs. The next attribute of an, of an international organization is exactly its statutory documents. Any international organization has a document upon which or on whose basis it works. Most of the time, these are treaties. Most of the time, international organizations are founded by treaties be concluded between states. What is the statutory document of the United Nations? The Charter of the UN. Yes. The Charter of the UN is technically a treaty that was concluded uh, in 1945 at San Francisco by how many states, by the way? No. In 1945, there were not as many states in existence yet. How many original members of the United Nations were there? Five. Five, no. Please check that. How many original member states of the UN were there? Especially given the fact that Ukraine was among the founding members of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So, any international organization has a statutory document, most of the time it is a treaty concluded between states. And states that join an international organization subsequently, they usually ratify the statutory document in accordance with the document, with the procedures set out in the document itself. Uh, next, any international organization has a seat, that is, it's a place where it is located. What is the seat of the United Nations? New York. New York. Uh, what, about, what about Geneva then? In Geneva there are some offices of the United Nations. Does it, does it make Geneva also a seat of the United Nations? Mm -hmm. 
Moreover, you're going to participate in the Jessup competition, which is a moot court competition imitating a, uh, a hearing in the International Court of Justice. Where is the ICJ located? It's in The Hague. Yes, it's the only main organ of the United Nations that is not in New York. Does, it, does, it make, does this fact make The Hague as the seat of the United Nations? Not quite. It makes, it makes it, uh, well, the, Hague is the, uh, the Hague is the location of one of the main organs of the UN, but it does not make the seat, it does not make it the seat of the UN. Uh, please read, read about that in the, in the materials provided. And finally, an international organization has to have a budget. Mm -hmm. So, no international organization can exist and function, operate without a budget. Budgets of international organizations are usually formed from contributions by member states. Do such contributions have to be equal? No? Uh, what does the size of a state's budgetary contribution depend on? Mm -hmm. And their their territory, their their population. So there is a quota that is determined on how much the state should pay mm -hmm. annually. It seems to me to the budget of mm -hmm. the organization. Very well, indeed. Contribu budgetary contributions of member states can can be different and are different. They depend on many different factors, including the GDP, the the size of the population, the size of the territory, or uh, the current economic situation, uh, there can be minimum and maximum contributions uh, assigned by the organization itself. What happens if a state does not pay its budgetary contributions? For example, to the United Nations. Yes, please. I think most probably or maybe uh, some kind of legal obligations must adhere to. Thank you very much. Indeed, if a state does not pay its budgetary contributions to the United Nations for more than two years in a row, uh, it may be suspended from voting in the General Assembly. Uh, this, is, this is provided in the Charter of the UN. So, each international organization sets its own rules uh, for states that fail to comply with their budgetary obligations. So, to make sure that you know exactly how this or that international organization operates, please look into the respective statutory documents. The statutory document of any international organization explains all the rules that essentially operate in that organization. The rules for admitting, suspending, and expelling members, the, the structure of the organization, the membership in this or that organ, the, whether the decisions of this or that organ within an organization are binding or are recommendations, etc. So, all those questions are answered in the statutory document of any international organization. So please be sure to read the, the documents of an international organization that you have to analyze, and you will get all the answers. To conclude with, uh, I will, let, me, let me say why the International Committee of the Red Cross is not an international organization, but at the same time, it is not an NGO. Yes, the ICRC is registered in Switzerland. Yes, technically, it is a Swiss legal entity. Its main governing body, the Assembly, consists only of Swiss nationals. However, it operates worldwide. It has some 80 delegations throughout the world. It has a 
It has a budget of about 1 billion Swiss francs. So it's quite a lot. Uh, yet it's not, it is not an intergovernmental or an NGO. Why so? We usually say the ICRC has a sui generis status, that is a special status, because being a Swiss organization, its mandate, its functions are laid down in international treaties, in the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and in the three additional protocols, respectively of 1977 and 2005. But we'll discuss this in more detail in our, in our last presentation on, uh, on Friday. To conclude with, yes. Uh, we started nine minutes later, so let's take five more minutes. Yes, please. Uh, according to the Montevideo Convention of 1933, talking about the attributes of states, you mentioned the territory, the permanent population, uh, the authorities, and the last one is the capacity. Now I'm wondering, why didn't they mention a system of legislation? Or is it possible for a state to exist without legal instruments, like the Constitution? Excellent question. Do you have an answer to this question? Can a state, can a state exist without laws? Brilliant question. and the legislature and the judicial system and the executive and the um, executive uh, branch mm -hmm. so it's uh, uh, probably um, all included um, I mean the authority and the government mm -hmm. thank you I would agree because the because the terms authority or government imply the division of labor so to say between the respective state organs that is the legislature the executive and the judiciary, it, impl it is implied that the legislature produces laws, that the executive enforces them, and that the judiciary settles disputes on the basis of these laws. So the existence, the existence of laws is implied in the third element, authority slash the government. Thank you very much. Uh, more questions? Well, no questions, as they say, either means that everything is clear or nothing is clear. Uh, yes, there is a question. I, I still hope that uh, the first option should be valid. The, yes, please. Um, you said that uh, the Eurovision did not be waived. Uh, we have an example of the uh, Chinese Republic and uh, Thank you. Do, do you have an answer to this question? Oh, and that was a question for everyone. So does anyone have an answer to this question? Let this be a home task, because it was a very interesting case in international law, whereby uh, the seat of a permanent member of the United Nations was inherited so, by people from another government within the same state. So it is provided in the Charter of the United Nations that uh, People's Republic of China is a permanent member of the Security Council, but 
it is true that at first the seat in the of the uh, the seat of China in the Security Council of the UN was held by representatives of one government that was then overtaken by another government. So the the state represented in the Security Council was the same, but the government changed. The government became different. Please see for yourselves how exactly this, this was dealt with. Time for one more question. Okay, let us then wrap up this, this class. You see, we have dealt with quite many issues of international law as law. We have, we have said that because it is international, it is essentially different from national law. Its philosophy is different. The way of its making is different from national or domestic law. And it has to be taken as a fact. And unlike private international law that regulates relations between private individuals, public international law essentially regulates relations between states, international organizations, some state-like entities such as the Vatican, but also among some non-state subjects. I have purposely left this aspect out of this class because we'll be dealing, dealing with it later in the course. International law also deals with uh, the behavior of individuals and some, some human groups, so-called non-state actors. We'll, we'll discuss that later on. The, as, as the very last idea, no, two ideas. Uh, please remember that international law is a law of coordination. So most domestic, in most domestic legal systems, law is a set of rules that subordinate so, groups of people to a higher authority. So domestic laws are essentially laws of subordination, whereas international law is essentially a law of coordination. States agree among themselves, they coordinate their, uh, their values among themselves. And second, sometimes people say that international law does not work. And let this be my very final point today. Do you agree that international law does not work? Oh, who would agree that international law does not work? Huh. One. Let me ask you why. Why do you think that international law does not work? I'm not saying that it does not work at all, but sometimes in some situations, we've been talking about values, and in some current situations we can talk about that um, the international values cannot um, influence these internal issues, these mm -hmm. internal values in some countries. Uh, for example, that uh, North Korean one. So mm -hmm. sometimes international work, international uh, law should find this approach, and it cannot uh, like use the instruments which are enforceable so much to destroy uh, the internal system. Mm -hmm. And thus, sometimes we can um, be very buried with the international issues, and thus international law is not one thousand percent mm -hmm. works. But still, like ninety. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would. I would fully agree with this, uh, with this statement. Interna there are ways for international law to, come to be integrated with domestic legal systems. There are ways in which international law and domestic law influence, influence each other. Please see for yourselves what monism means and what dualism means. So, there are there is a so-called monist theory of relationship between international law and domestic law, and there is a so-called dualist theory of relationship between respectively international and domestic law. And let me conclude by reference to a professor of international law, Louis Henkin, 
who said that most of international law is complied with by most of the states most of the time. That's probably the right way to, to put it. International law does work. However, it works most of the time, and, and, but not all of the time. And among most of the states, but not all of them. And how exactly this happens, we'll discuss over the next four days. Let me thank you very much for this very good beginning. Thank you.